Today, it's all about which accessories that I recommend to really get the most out of the Sony FX6. And in this video, we'll be looking at ways to enhance this camera from the inside out. So with all that out of the way, let's get started. Frequently, I get asked about which equipment I pair with the FX6, and I'll start with the most common question first, which is, what mic do I use? So I film with the Sony XLR K3M. It turns out to be the only mic that I have that really fits in the FX6's mic holder. Originally, I had bought this mic to go with the A7S III, but it turns out the XLR K3M is a pretty solid mic to have, especially while doing uh, event videography and running gun interviews. Although it's not the highest quality mic, the FX6's audio settings combined with the mic allow for professional audio. So this is what the XLR K3M sounds like on the FX6. And this is what scratch audio on the FX6 sounds like. Speaking of event videography, I use this next accessory quite a bit and it is the RM1 BP Lens Controller. It controls the zoom functionality on lenses such as the 28 to 135 f4 power zoom. So you might be thinking to yourself, what's wrong filming on the 28 to 135 f4 without the zoom controller? Well, it's an eight year old lens that isn't really cine lens quality, and the zoom controller is oftentimes a little jerky, and it has sort of a, like a camcorder feel. That's the best way I can put it. So I'm out here overlooking the Manhattan skyline with the FX6. I got the zoom controller attached right here, and I'll be A-B testing the servo zoom vis-a-vis -vis the zoom controller itself and you can see how the servo zoom differs from the zoom controller so let's take a look so this is going full speed normal zoom on the servo and you get kind of a pulsing when you're zooming it's not really as immediate and you don't really feel like you have as much control as when you move on to this take a look so I'll be doing normal zoom direction. You also have reverse on the zoom controller, but just for the sake of simplicity, I'll be using the normal zoom direction and I'll be using uh, slow. So it's a bit more gradual. And if you wanna take it back, you can just like that by holding it down. So now we're going to test out medium and see how this looks. And finally fast. So you can really go quick. There's the vessel right there. And so in filming professionally, you generally want to achieve higher production value for your clients. And so the zoom controller allows for a much smoother overall look with the customized zoom control. Although bear in mind, this zoom controller does show its age as some of these buttons, uh, they do not work on the FX6. However, these buttons that don't work, they're largely inconsequential and it does not affect the controller in like a, a big way as things like um, speed options, as well as the zoom rocker itself, it still works flawlessly. So the FX6's monitor leaves a lot to be desired, right? Oftentimes when filming manually, and even with peaking turned on, it can be difficult to see the screen of the camera and achieve critical focus in certain uh, circumstances. And that's why I went with the FX9 Loop Modification Kit by CVP uh, for the FX6. It took me about a half an hour to assemble, and aside from the modification kit, all I really needed was a guitar pick, a small magnetic bolt to uh, catch screws, and a precision screwdriver. And I was able to have this modification kit up and running. Uh, it's a bit of a head scratcher as to why Sony didn't offer something similar for the FX6, as the manual focus experience has improved significantly for me. And I will put a link in the description below to this product, as well as everything else I talk about in this video. And at this time, I'd like to take a look at some questions and comments you all have. 
First up, from the FX6 review video, Macta972 writes, just wanna say thank you for the footage. It's not easy to find good footage from that camera. Before getting the camera, I found this to be the case as well, uh, likely due to the chip shortage and supply chain issues. Um, but thank you for the comment. Overall, it was a lot of fun filming that day in Istanbul. I think we got a lot of great footage. Up next, uh, Blackbirdie Golf, who asks, have you had the whole scene in focus with the Panasonic S5? I film mostly golf vlogs, so I need the whole scene in focus. Do you know if the S5 does a good job with that? Great video. For that video, it was a combination of manual and autofocus. With the S5's autofocus efficiency, you can achieve semi-consistent results, and for a vlog, it would work perfectly fine, um, especially with the 20 to 60 millimeter kit lens. However, you have to ask yourself how important production quality is to you, as the background pulsing can be distracting and problematic. And that is due to Panasonic's depth from the focus autofocus system. Another Panasonic related comment, Tim Wright says, I have noticed that if I shoot in 60 frames per second with the APS-C crop, then working at 60 frames per second for autofocus, it works twice as good. Twice the scan, twice as good. Filming in 4K 60p with the APS-C crop along with the native 50 millimeter f1.4 prime, that's the way to go. That is the fastest lens in the L-mount lineup for autofocus. And I found this combination of glass and recording settings was uh, the most efficient. Pivoting to the 28-135 f4 video, uh, Media Smith Films writes, I picked up the 28-135 f4 used, very cheap. I found it to be a bit soft. I do like that it has optical stabilization. My Sigma 24-70 is noticeably sharper. Been using both on a Sony FX3. So the 28-135 is a bit soft, right? Although that softer look is almost a novelty nowadays considering the abundance of tack sharp Sony E-mount lenses on the market. But you know, it would be interesting to see a Mark II release for the 28-135. It's been eight years after all. And maybe it would veer a bit sharper, maybe a bit lighter, like a 20%, 30% weight reduction. Kind of like what we've seen Sony do with the Mark II iterations of the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200 G Masters. Now I appreciate everyone's questions and comments and I look forward to seeing more of your thoughts in the future. Now moving on to gimbal work. The DJI RS3 Pro is the gimbal that I use. It features a 10 pound payload capacity, meaning you're more than covered with the FX6. Although that's the same payload capacity as its predecessor, Generally, I use 35mm f1.8 with this gimbal system because the lens, it's wide enough to capture action, but it's not so wide that there's distortion around the edges. And it also doesn't have focus breathing, like the 35mm f1.4 G Master, although that is kind of a moot point now with focus breathing compensation via firmware 2.0 circumventing any focus breathing. The RS3 Pro comes with a video transmission system allowing you to sync your phone and use it in conjunction with the gimbal where you can fine tune your settings. And this specific version of the DJI RS3 is made up of carbon fiber and it weighs about 3.3 pounds. Now when you add in the weight of the FX6 which is around 2 pounds and say use uh, the BPU35 battery you're looking at 2.5 pounds camera and battery together. Now throw in an aforementioned lens like the 35 millimeter and you're looking at about six and a half pounds altogether. I know I keep mentioning weight specifics, but I can't help but think that these things matter when you're shooting for long periods of time. For external recording, the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus is what I use, and my reasoning is two-pronged. So the Sony Alpha 1 can record an 8K resolution, and the FX6 can record 4K 120p ProRes RAW. The Ninja 5 Plus allows recording for both of those features, whereas the regular Ninja 5 does not. Barring those recording options, there aren't many things that differentiate the Ninja 5 from the Ninja 5 Plus. Now admittedly, I picked up a Ninja 5 Plus to really future-proof and achieve higher production value for clients by incorporating higher frame rate and resolution options. So the last accessory I want to cover is the FX Lion lithium-ion battery and its attachment piece for the FX6. So lithium-ion battery systems like this are pretty common nowadays, and you really can't go wrong with any manufacturer that produces similarly sized uh, battery systems. Although I do prefer the size, durability, and form factor of the FX Lines Nano 1 and Nano 2 battery systems. It's the same system I've used on the Panasonic cameras, so 
I've been working with these products for a couple of years now. In particular, the FX Lines Nano 2 is competitively light compared to larger battery unit alternatives. And the USB-C cable port is an added bonus so you can simultaneously power the FX6 and charge your phone at the same time. Also, you can of course use FX Line batteries to power external recording devices uh, like the Ninja 5 Plus. So overall, these accessories have enhanced my filmmaking experience on the FX6 the most, and I hope you find these products uh, similarly useful in your own filmmaking experiences. And if you have an accessory that helps your filmmaking experience on the FX6, I'd love to hear about it, so feel free to mention it in the comments below. And as always, if you found this video helpful or insightful, give a big thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, comment below, let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next one.